few weeks later, I was in Newcastle. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was on the metro in Newcastle. And this drunk guy got down. He could hardly focus. Sat opposite me on the metro and he said, Milton, brilliant. <laughs> and that meeting was the pinnacle of my quizzing. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So really pleased to welcome Brian Pendry to All Things Quiz. Hi, Brian. Hi, Gareth. Hi. Brian has had quite a uh, career in journalism and in quizzing and now as an author. So we're here to talk to Brian and find out a bit more about that. Brian, can you give us a bit of a background to uh, to how you got into quiz and, and your early quizzing experience? Uh, well, sort of three things go together, really. That's writing, mm. film and quizzing. They all sort of overlap <laughs> in a way. Um, I grew up in a quizzing household. Mm. Um, we quizzed when it was unfashionable to quiz. Uh, and I would quite often say when most of the people in the audience weren't born, but with our audience, probably that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but um, in the mid 1980s, there was a very popular quiz show in Scotland called Super Scott. And it was specifically a quiz on Scottish things, mm -hmm. be it history or geography, be it pop music, be it football, it had to have a Scottish link. And it was presented by one of uh, uh, Scotland, Jane Frankie was one of Scotland's best known news anchors. Um, in a way, it was it was a different format from Mastermind, but in a way it was kind of quite similar. Um, it wasn't a game show, it was an out and out quiz. It began with a buzzer round and it ended with a buzzer round. And in between you got your kind of individual questions. Um, and that was in the mid-1980s. I entered that, and unknown to myself, my uncle, Jim Brunton, who gives yeah. his name to the Brunton Shield, uh, which is an annual match between Lisa Scotland and Tyne and Weir. Uh, Jim also entered Super Scott. Um, it went out on Friday nights on BBC One, so it was mainstream television. So I entered and Jim entered. We both won for our first rounds. We both won for our second rounds. So we ended up with myself and my uncle both in the final of Super Scott. Uh, now, after the first buzzer round, um, I had a seven-point lead. You couldn't see your scores. Everybody got their individual questions. I think everybody got full. They were slow individual questions like identify a mystery object, identify a photograph. I think everybody scored pretty much full marks because at the end, going into the final buzzer round, I was still seven points clear and I couldn't see my score. Um, it was two points for an absolutely correct answer. I can't remember if it was one for a bonus. It might have been two for a bonus as well. Um, and it was back in the days, it was pre-digital. So if somebody got something wrong, you're with thumping the buzzer, hoping that it would reset and you would get in first. So you've got thump, 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 thump. And then you see the person that's buzzed third and the question going over to them. So it got to the final question. Uh, I thought I was still three points. I thought I was a question in the head half ahead and Jim my uncle got in first and got that question right um, and I thought maybe I'm only one point ahead and in fact I was one point behind it was only when the scores were read out that I realized that uh, somebody else had beaten me it wasn't Jim Jim came third now it was recorded I think two months before it went out but it had been a lengthy journey through the first round the semi-final the final and Jim and I, we'd been round the museums, we'd been to the People's Palace independently, and we'd both compiled these huge notebooks, everything you could possibly know about Scotland. I mean, I was in my 20s at the time, Jim was obviously a generation older. So we got together and we thought, I wonder if there's anything we can do with this. And this was before, this was in, publishing was a very different thing then mm -hmm. quizzing was a very different thing both had these huge notebooks and we thought can we get a book out in two months so we got together and we brainstormed and we came up with an idea of a scottish quiz book with uh, a slightly different format you'd have questions on one side with the answers immediately over the page uh, we would bring it out with this print run guaranteed we would bring it bring it out at a price of 199 um, I designed the cover myself. It's pretty mm -hmm. basic. My dad worked, he was an executive with the printers. Um, 
they printed sort of bank stationery, but he was able to get a designer to execute my sort of very basic design into a reasonable cover. We fixed up the printer in Stirlingshire by ourselves. We saw the printing process, oversaw the printing process, oversaw the print run, sold it all. We printed it under, we made up a name called John Lennox Publications, because my middle name's John and Jim's is Lennox. Uh, we brought it out as John Lennox Publications. We sold all the books to Loman Books. We, the, we launched it the day after the transmission. We did a book signing at an independent bookshop in Edinburgh. There was a queue in the street of people wanting signatures, uh, wanting books signed, because it was 199 which even then, 1986, was cheap. And it went into the Scottish bestsellers list. And that was, a, that was obviously my first quiz book. Um, it was my first book. I was already a journalist at that time. I was on the staff of the Scotsman, so the Scotsman said, oh. I mean, it was disappointing to lose the final, obviously, hugely disappointing. Uh, possibly one of the most, possibly my most disappointing moment in quiz. Well, there was a Brunton Shield, there was a Brunton Shield moment as well. <laughs> but uh, the Scotsman said, oh, would you do us uh, a weekly quiz, you and Jim? So we did that. And then the sports desk said, would you do us a weekly sports quiz? So Jim and I were working on that as well. So I was still working full-time as a journalist. Um, the Scotsman then brought out the Scotsman quiz book. We were doing the sports quiz. I mean, sport is one of my weaker genres. Um, and uh, unbeknownst to us, the powers that be in hockey had changed from a buoy off to just a straightforward kickoff and they never told us so we got cut out on that one I think we got caught out a couple when it came to the Scottish quiz book actually I can't remember what which question it was but the printers phoned up and they said you've got a thousand and one answers but you don't have a thousand and one questions you <laughs> questions and they said wh whichever number it was they said something like number 800 the answer is central but there's no question to go with it and we're on the point of printing. So I was sitting in the Scotsman at the time, so I immediately had to think up a question that would fit the answer central. Anyway, that's going back. So the Scotsman quiz book came out. Uh, that was my first two books. From there, I'd started specialising to some extent in film journalism. And my next book, which was great fun to do, was a book that nobody had done a location, a film location guide aimed at the general public. So it was an anecdotal guide called On Location, uh, the film fans guide to Britain and Ireland. And it enabled me to go around lots of places in Britain and Ireland and claim it as, uh, claim it against uh, taxable expenses, bring out this book, which, uh, and I mean, I did all the photographs for that as well. I cleared all the rights. Never again would I do that. Mm -hmm. It was more mm -hmm. difficult than writing the book, but that was the second book, took off from there. Uh, I did film biographies, I did other books on films, and I mean, the novel has probably taken me 30 years to write. Mm -hmm. uh, before the novel, there was a short story, which now fits into the novel. It's now the end of the novel. And in that short story, I was writing about a writer who, um, I, I'm writing about a writer who, had, it's vaguely based on a Scottish writer called Alan Sharp, who was lionised in the 1960s in Scotland, went off to Hollywood, wrote four scripts on spec in Hollywood. Uh, every single one of them was filmed by a big Hollywood studio and by leading stars of the day, Gene Hackman, George C. Scott, Peter Fonda. It includes uh, The Hired Hand, um, The Last Run with George C. Scott. They all got filmed. And then Alan rather disappeared. I mean, he was a bit of a character. He had number of children by different women. Beryl Brain Bainbridge had a child by him. I arranged to meet him in London. He forgot I was coming and he was in, I don't know which women's house it was, but in the middle of the day, he opened the door in his dressing gown. He was watching the Olympics. He was quite a character. So the central character was loosely based on him, and a novelist that had turned his back on it to become a film writer who'd made money and then turned his back on everything and become slightly reclusive. Um, and yeah, so I would actually began working on that short story. I thought William Wallace was a great character for a film. And I began working on that short story before the film Braveheart was made, which is how long ago it is, because Braveheart shot in 94. 
Uh, then, curiously, coincidentally, and this is a whole other story, I became involved in Braveheart through the writer of Braveheart, who was called Randall Wallace, who came on Scotland and was fascinated by the fact that there was this other, there was a statue at Edinburgh Castle and it said Wallace on it, which was his name, which is why he began writing about William Wallace and he got in touch with me as somebody that was a film journalist and knew about film locations. So you can see how everything begins to tie together. I wound up going to the Oscars, doing a biography on Mel Gibson, sort of panned out from there. Uh, fascination with films, events. I, I did the short story, I did the novel that, um, and it came out in 2000 and 2011, I think, yeah, nine years ago. At that time, everyone was saying the printed book is dead, ebooks are the future. My agent placed it with a new company that was doing ebooks, and my agent at the time, Stan, said, This is great, it will never go out of print. The irony is that the company went bust, and The Man in the Seventh Row, the movie lover's novel, um, became the only one of my books that you couldn't actually get anywhere because the ebook company had gone bust. All my other books, although they were out of print, you could now get them readily on eBay or through Abe books. The Man in the Seventh Row, you just couldn't get, apart from the fact that although it was a digital publication, it was part of the launch titles for this new company. They had six launch titles, five of which were crime, which didn't help me either. Mm -hmm. And they brought them out on a USB stick in an expensive presentation box. <laughs> so it did actually exist in a very, very limited physical form. Um, they went bust. So Amazon kind of took off in terms, Kindle took off in terms of self-publishing it because I'd always associated self-publishing with vanity publishing. Um, I'd always had a conventional publisher, apart from the ebook publisher, for virtually all my books, apart from the early quiz books, I'd had an agent, but the rights reverted to me, and I thought I could do more with the book. The book, could, when the ebook came out, I got fantastic notices from people like Ian Rankin, Andrew Marr, um, Janice Forsyth, Barry Norman, but it didn't really connect with the public. It wasn't available in a physical form anyway, in a printed form. I thought I wasn't entirely happy with it. I thought I could do more with it. It's about a guy being sucked into the movies and changing the action of the movies that he's in. You don't know if this is fantasy or why it's happening. Um, there are a lot of sort of cinematic motifs. There are actually a lot of allusions in it that I think quizzers will get and hopefully love because they will spot what I'm doing with it. Although I did a book club event last week and there was a woman, an Australian woman there in her early thirties, knew nothing about Citizen King, knew nothing about Rosebud as a motif or a symbol. And yet she got all the pointers. I'm not saying that there is a definitive interpretation to the book, uh, but I mean, it was, it's good just when people get it. Yeah, no, I, I, I bought it on the ebook when it came out at the time. And I remember reading it and, you know, I'm a movie lover and I like the kind of the slightly fantastical and slightly surreal element and that that you you don't join all the dots for everybody. That mm. there, there's a lot for people to kind of muse on and ponder and kind of come to their own conclusions. So mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see where you've gone, you know, a few years down the line, taking it to to whatever conclusion you've gone to with the additional content. Um yeah. There, there's three extra short stories, you might call them chapters. Mm. Two of them are really quite peripheral. They touch on themes mm. that are touched on in the novel. The third one is a very different, a very definite conclusion to the novel, but with different characters. Um, obviously, one of the themes in the novel is it's playing with notions, of, it's playing with cinema to begin with, it's playing with films. So it's playing with notions of real, what is real, what is reality, what is fantasy. And also the very fact that it's a novel, it's fiction, um, as opposed to other books that I've written. And I'm, I play with the idea, more so I play with the idea in the additional material. But it's very much you on a page though, isn't it? Because it's not just the, the movie side of things, but as I remember, if I remember correctly, there's also the, the Scottish setting and, yes. and kind of the basis from that. It's very much a, a Scottish um, a Scottish novel, for want of a better word. Yeah, um, yeah, that's it's, fair. It's um, in, a, in, a, in a place. Is it very much so? It's 
about a guy in Los Angeles, which I know reasonably well, going to watch classic films that he fell in love with as a young boy in the 60s and 70s in Edinburgh and the seaside resort of North Berwick. So it's rooted there. So there's a strong element of nostalgia in it, which then segues into an element of magical realism and something, I don't want to say darker, but something deeper. Um, I don't, I mean, one of the, I actually came across a review uh, you kind of take reviews for granted when you've got a conventional publisher. And I came across a review from first time round. I just came across it a few months ago, a very extensive, very positive review, which I've quoted in some detail, a little bit of detail in the new edition. And the writer there said, I think he said it was compelling, breathtaking, but he also did say it's challenging. And I wouldn't want to overemphasize that because it begins with quite a cozy sense of nostalgia. It's not challenging in the way that Ulysses is challenging. I wouldn't want to put people off. No, but, but, but it's not sort of chewing gum for the eyes, as it were, where you can just kind of, you know, Dan Brown, like just page turn. You, you do have to engage with it and think about it rather than just let it kind of wash over you. I would hope that, I would hope that people think about, I mean, there's a lot of the, the stuff from childhood, people my age might remember things like, Double bills, continuous performances. Yeah. Where I mean, the, the young girl that I was talking about earlier, who was thirty and from Australia, she's saying, "Was this a fictional device that the man actually goes into a film halfway through, watches the second half, watches the adverts in the cartoon, watches another whole movie, then watches the first half of the movie?" I'm saying, and, and at the book club that I was at, there was a woman that was a good bit older than me. She was saying, "No, we used to do that all the time. That was routine." And a lot has a lot of changed when you talk about those sorts of things. I'm just just old enough to remember the intermission, um, which now you know you wouldn't dream of interrupting a film to have a, a ten minute break while someone tries to sell you ice cream. Yeah, yeah, that's what they did. That's what they did with the three hour films. I think yeah. I don't know if they still did it with Dances with Wolves uh, if it had an intermission, but certainly things like Doctor Shivago, yeah. Lawrence of Arabia had an intermission. Um, I rewatched something recently, one of the Roman epics on TV, where they brought up a card, it was on Netflix or Prime, and the card came up saying intermission, and they played the music that went with the intermission card. Oh, it was the, the fall of the Roman Empire, I think. Yeah, the quizzing stuff never went away during that whole period. And the quizzing stuff, never, I mean, I was, I trained as a journalist. Um, I was on the Scotsman staff for 17 years. When I went, I went freelance in 1997 um, and wrote a biography of Ewan McGregor, which is probably, it's the book from which I made most money. It came out in Japanese translation. There was an American edition. It was when Ewan McGregor was going to Star Wars, but there was no story arc. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a particularly satisfying book to write. It was a particularly satisfying book to get the money for, uh, but not particularly satisfying to write. I left the Scotsman... Uh, I had a bit of a thought. I didn't get on with the new editor. I was cinema editor and he replaced the film critic without consulting me. Mm -hmm. um, so I left. I had nothing to go to. Within a month, I think, I had an agent who was the same agent as Faye Weldon and Vikram Seth had. I had a contract to do the Ewan McGregor book and I had a regular working arrangement with the Sunday Times who sent me to the Cannes Film Festival for several years to cover it. Very nice. <laughs> And I could see behind you your 15 to 1 trophy. So yeah. is that is that the pinnacle of your quiz achievements? Um no, probably not. Um I know that if you kind of look on one of the sites on the internet, if you look up Mastermind, it sort of mentions me as getting one of the highest ever general knowledge scores, which was it's not as high as Kevin's, no. but I did I scored 34 points, of which 20 came from general knowledge. But I mean, these days, of course, people don't get that number of questions. But I mean, the pinnacle was probably my pub quiz team has played Eggheads three times with different lineups. Um, and obviously I had first bite of the cherry <laughs> and it went, we were two of us, one of our guys managed to put out Kevin, uh, on sport. So there was two of us, uh, three of us against three of them in the final. And it went to a couple of tie breaks as it sometimes does. And the, I mean, I'll always remember 
And we went second. So we knew if they got something wrong and we got something right, we'd won. And they got something to do with Central American presidents or something, it was impossible, uh, as CJ complained afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> we, and our question was, which English writer wrote the doctrine and discipline of divorce? So I discussed it with the two guys. I mean, nobody else had any input. And I said, well, it could be Betjeman. I know he was Catholic, I knew he was divorced. And Jeremy Vine saying, take as long as you want, take as long as you want. Something gets Betjeman. And I'm about to answer, and then I turned to Mark and RD and said, or could it be Milton? <laughs> <laughs> so we had further discussion, and Mark said, oh, I don't know, just say whatever you want. But this time, Jeremy Vine's saying, we are going to need an answer. And I was 50 50, and I said, Milton. Yes. And Jeremy Vine said, I knew you'd get there in the end. And then, <laughs> on the back of that, a few weeks later, I was in Newcastle. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was on the metro in Newcastle. And this drunk guy got down. He could hardly focus. Sat opposite me on the metro. And he said, Milton. Brilliant. <laughs> and that meeting was the pinnacle of my quizzing. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. And, of course, you mentioned your, your pub quiz team, which is called yeah. The Dude Abides, yeah. which mm -hmm. connects to your cinema love because it's a reference to the Big Lebowski. So yes, it yeah. really does knit in together, doesn't it? Yeah. We frequently get Big Lebowski questions and we frequently get them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> We're all into tennis or, or we've played tennis or something and we never get the tennis questions right. <laughs> Well, it's always one of those things, if you see a doctor on a quiz show, you know, they're dreading getting a question about medicine or something. We're both thinking of exactly the same doctor, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. Um, that's great. So, so we should really cover, do you think? Um... Not really. The only other thing that I'd say was... I mean, it sort of begins with the Scottish quiz book, which I think you can yeah. pick up on eBay. I mean, obviously, you can't buy it now. The Man in the Seventh Row... Uh, is it's around in two versions because I brought out the original version just so that it was there. But if people are ordering it, I'd rather they ordered the one that has the extra chapters. It's on Amazon. It's in some bookshops. You should be able to order it through any bookshop. Mm -hmm. um, it is now available in America as well. The book that I said, I mean, I kept on saying I wasn't going to write any more books because there was no money in them. The middle market disappeared. Mm -hmm. But two years ago... I had a book out, I guess four years ago, I was approached by the Times to edit the Times on cinema, um, which wasn't a great money spinner, but this is, in a way, I think of it as being the sister book to the novel. This is the perfect, so if, if Quiz is going to have one cinema book, I would recommend it's this, because it covers all the, I was given a blank page and told, use whatever you want from the Times uh, reviews, interviews, lists, and you know they would bring out the top 100 films ever, the top 50 greatest actors ever. Um, so it's full of that sort of stuff, the greatest French movies ever, the greatest animated f movies ever. It's full of that sort of stuff. Um, I did intend, but never got around to it, to have a look at a quiz paper and, see, and look at the film question and see just how many answers are in that book. Mm, but would be interesting. And everybody is always looking out for that one resource Mm -hmm, can, mm -hmm. particularly if it's not your strong area that can be your shortcut and mm. if you're a contextual learner can allow you to link things together directors and actors and plots and you know use all of that to try and draw an answer out from somewhere so it sounds like it's the perfect book for for quizzes who really want to blitz the, the cinematic subject well thank you very much for your time Brian, uh, for giving us insights into your quizzing, uh, but also into your journey into being a, a fiction author. Wish you lots of success with um, The Man in the Seventh Row, the movie <laughs> lover's novel, or whatever the subtitle officially is, um, and hope that people do go out and buy it. Having read the earlier iteration, I'll be really interested to now see um, the additional content. And, uh, sure. Thanks. Thank you very much. Not just buy it, but read it, hopefully enjoy it. If you enjoy it, Talk about it, post a five star review on Amazon. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much, Brian. Right, thanks, Gareth. Cheers. <laughs>